Okay, so uh, we may move to another uh, point of view, and uh, Naren, uh, Narendra Taneja, uh, who is the chairman and uh, independent energy policy institute, uh, which is a, a new Delhi think tank. So I leave, I leave you the floor to discuss about the governance, please. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the last almost couple of hours this has been very different uh, color and mood in the room, so I don't know. Uh, you see, the, uh, the global energy gravis, gravity center is no longer in Europe or Atlantic, it's in Asia. And uh, uh, the 405 billion energy consumers in Asia, they are consuming, uh, you know, maximum energy. Uh, and that's where the future lies, whether you're a Western company or Eastern company, you're from Europe or Russia or America, if you want to secure your future, you have to look at Asia. That's the reality. However, when I travel to conferences like this, it's a conference actually in Global South, in Abu Dhabi, in Asia. But since yesterday morning, I've been feeling I'm in Europe somewhere, <laughs> and 70% of the time I feel is an echo chamber, you're talking to each other. Then why did I travel from Delhi? Or why did, for instance, people travel from Africa? So you have got this habit. You got to understand the world has changed. The world has changed. And you see, uh, in Global North, there are only 1.4 billion people. In Global South, there are 6.7 billion people, including people in Abu Dhabi. This is Global South. We got to understand and acknowledge it. You see, uh, I, I travel to Europe almost every month, and it's so suffocating to go to conferences. Because you, you know, the, the world is changing. Today, BRICS, somebody mentioned today, BRICS total GDP on PPP basis, actually, BRICS is today bigger. From the 1st of January, BRICS is bigger than G7. Why don't people realize that in Europe, in Western part of the world? Why there is no realization that, look, it's a one small planet, and the world has changed. Energy, we, in this room, we're discussing energy. And going by the question answer, it seems that only region that matters is Europe and maybe the United States. That's the end of the world or the beginning of the world. My friends, the world has changed. You have already spoken for two hours, so allow me 10, 12 minutes now, because this is where the heart of the global energy is. So I'm representing the heart. I'm going to focus on energy governance and uh, 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 global energy order, and therefore, of course, security. You see, the fact is half, the, half of the world today is not even talking to each other. Because you're Russian, because you're Chinese, or because you're Hamas, or because you're Israeli, or because you're Africa, you're very poor. You don't deserve to be in the high trouble. Somebody mentioned yesterday, that the richest continent on the, on the planet is Africa. So we got to understand that whether it's energy or is climate, you know, we need to engage the whole world. Unless the discussion or the conversation is truly global, we will actually end up reaching to the wrong conclusions. And when the conclusions are wrong, solutions that we propose to the world or for that matter to the people of Europe would not really produce any results. And uh, look at, for instance, climate. Climate for us in India, we have 1.4 billion people, densely populated country. Climate for us is science. How do, we, how do we go forward? On the one hand, we have to eradicate energy poverty, and at the same time, we have to mobilize sufficient energy for our people. How do we do that? So it's science. But for many in the global north, I'm not targeting anybody. You know, I love Europe. I spent nine years of my life in Europe. I went to universities in Europe. But for many, climate has become a religion. You just can't have conversation on, on this matter. If you say, look, I mean, there are three billion people energy poor on the planet. We need to engage with them. We need to do what, no, it's a religion. How can you question it? I'm not saying everybody, but there are many. And that has become a, a, that has become a problem. 
And at the same time, when you look at the global narratives, whether global narratives on energy or global narratives on climate, because the West has the experience, you have a good think tanks, you have diplomats, you know how to articulate, is English language, is the French language, is and all that. All these narratives are dominated by the West. I'm sorry to use the expression, but that's the reality. So the result is, what we have seen in this room, for instance, and we have seen in the uh, conference also since yesterday, that that has become a challenge. The result is, until very recently, energy and climate were always talked in the same breath. Now, the global north, or if I may use the expression, the West, has decoupled it. Now, say so energy is a different, is sovereign, different world, and climate is, if you're talking climate, you can't talk energy. Energy, then basically you can talk only about, only about uh, uh, renewables. This climate extremism is, is, is actually bad for climate security. Because if you can't have conversation, how can we find a solution? Is bad for climate security, is bad for energy security also. Now, this is this climate radicalization that we see in quarters in the global north is today the biggest threat to energy transition. Because unless we go about for honest conversation where the interest of everyone is taken care of, how do we move forward? How do we move forward? And I give you an example. In my city, I live in New Delhi, we recently hosted G20 summit. And you know one thing? In G20, we have tracks on everything. We have tracks, tracks means this conversation on agriculture, on medical sciences, on damn everything you name it, and it was there. But not a single track on traditional energy, fossil fuels. They were kept out of the room, completely. Energy, a green energy, many tracks. In the final declaration, no mention. And this is G20. I asked some people, because we hosted it, but a host does mean that you control the narrative, because narrative is still controlled by the West. And they said, oh, they don't want it. Now, imagine, you're talking, you are G20, you are talking of securing future, but you, are, you have no discussion on that. Now the biggest challenge is, the biggest challenge today basically is that the way I see it, that no conversation is allowed on this, that we need to kind of recouple energy and climate. There is no other way. There is absolutely no other way. Number two, this tendency on the part of the global north to have conversation on the energy transition roadmap energy, energy transition, which is basically the way they want it. Not realizing energy and climate. Go to any village in Africa, go to any village in Asia, go to any village in Latin America. These are highly emotional issues and local issues. People worship trees, people worship local sources of energy. For many, energy and climate are very deeply integrated the way they live, the way they breathe. But if you think the West has got the solution and they have the template, you either accept it or we are, you, we are going to make your life difficult. If you are a smaller developing country, we will punish you one way or another. If you are a big giant like India, well, we can't punish you, but still, we will see. That's not how we work. Energy transition, different countries, different you know, uh, uh, characteristics. Third point I want to make here is, look, Ukraine happened. Prime Minister of Senegal yesterday, she, was, she spoke there, Senegal. She used the word, and quoting her, um, these are not my words. She said, Ukraine is white men's war. Uh, these are not my quote. I'm just quoting her, she said yesterday. Now, the point is that, you know, the result was that energy has been weaponized. And you know who has suffered the most? Yes, in Europe you build fortress, you got from the, you replaced your Russian energy with American energy and Australian and so forth. But do you realize that there are three billion energy poor in the rest of the world? Do you realize they are the one who paid the price? 
Do you realize that, you know, how many children might have died because of that? How many family budgets might have been disrupted and actually killed? How many people realize that? Uh, can you have discussion on this in Europe? I have tried. Trust me. It does work. They don't want to listen to you. Because they love most as echo chamber. They love to talk with each other. Now the point here is that, you know, uh, when it comes to, when it comes to uh, uh, priorities, you see, I mean, they can have, they have the right, because they have money, they have technology, they have everything. But the point is, if we really are looking for solution, that's not the way to do it. Now, question is, you know, on a positive note, now what do we do? What to do? I think we need to, when it comes to climate conversations, you know, New Abu Dhabi is going to host the next COP summit. I'm not too optimistic. I'm very blunt. We need to basically reset the button on climate. Climate energy transition used to be in the very top of the agenda, global agenda, until two years ago, three years ago. Honestly, tell me, is climate now on the top of the global agenda? It's not. It's Ukraine. It's crisis in the Middle East. It's Taiwan. Tomorrow is going to be something else. But when it comes to climate, if you want to have results, if you are really worried about you know, the global climate, you have to reset the button. We need to go back to the table. We need to really rework. Now, second thing is, we need to democratize all these discussions and conversation on climate and energy transition. Obviously, I mean that the process is not democratic. It's not democratic. It's mostly top-down, and top-down from the global north to the global south. Yes, countries like India and China, we assert ourselves because we can. But what about these 54 countries in Africa? How many countries in Africa can actually assert? There can be sanctions against them without calling them sanctions. Now, at the same time, I mean, there are many other things to do. De-weaponize oil. De-weaponize it. Gas. You're playing with the lives of the people, the future of the children, future of you know, the economies of smaller countries and more vulnerable economy. 80% countries in the world, they are energy deficit. 80%. They import energy. The biggest trade in the world is actually oil. Oil is number one, roughly accounts for 60% of the total global trade. Now, the point here is that, you know, at the same time, when it comes to uh, issues like, you know, uh, technology, green finance and all that, again, we need to reset set the button there. And we recouple again, as I said earlier, you know, energy and climate. And at the same time, is there any global energy order in the world? Where is the order? The world is all united. We are basically, is the polarization that's happening. If Russian oil and gas is banned, if it's sanctioned, Russians will have to find a way to sell it to whosoever can buy it. That means you actually are creating a parallel order. And in India, there was a question this to us. I mean, if Russians offer us better discount, you know, we will buy from Russia. If the U.S. offers, we will buy from U.S. If it's offered by Rwanda, we will buy from Rwanda. Oil has no nationality. Molecule has no nationality. We will just buy it from there. What's wrong with it? You see, that's how it works. And then the, my important point is everybody is now saying that, you know, rule-based international order, rule-based international energy order. Who makes the rules? Who has made these rules? The West. And if you don't follow, then you are questioned. And if you follow, then you have to become a subservient. So what kind of world we are talking about? So just to close it, you know, I, you can understand, you know, I'm putting a different perspective. And many of you are not used to listening to this kind of thing. So you'll say, who is this man? Where does he come from? We were so easy. So we were enjoying, you know, this echo chamber. But this echo chamber has been punctured. So sorry for that, if you think that's the way you feel. But the fact is, we need a global, a new international energy order. Number two, we, knew, uh, we need a new international energy governance. And number three, we ideally need a global, new global organization, which is basically can play some role in situation like this, circumstances like this, can step in and play some role. And fi my final point is that, for God's sake, de-weaponize oil, gas, and energy. It's important. There are many other things you can play with, 
weaponize them if that's important, but this is something three billion energy poor on the planet, they need it. So for their sake, if you have any love for humanity, any love, and West talks about humanity and whatnot, I think de-weaponize it. Let oil and gas and these th or all these uh, commodities flow so that people can at least survive. Unless and until they survive, how can they really worry about things like climate? Thank you very much. Thanks for your patience. Thank you. I have a, a real...